I want to close with some comments uh, from R.C. Sproul's work, uh, Chosen by God. Uh, he says this here, How can God hold Pharaoh or anyone else accountable for sin that flows out of a heart that God himself hearted? Our answer to that question will depend on how we understand God's act of hardening. How did he harden Pharaoh's heart? The Bible does not answer that question explicitly. As we think about it, we realize that basically there are only two ways he could have hardened Pharaoh's heart, actively or passively. Active hardening would involve God's direct intervention within the inner chambers of Pharaoh's heart. God would intrude into Pharaoh's heart and create fresh evil in it. This would certainly ensure that Pharaoh would bring forth the result that God was looking for. It would also ensure that God is the author of sin. Obviously, this is going to be the one that uh, Calvinists, Reformed Calvinists reject, but a hyper-Calvinist uh, would certainly um, endorse that. I am not a hyper-Calvinist, so I do not. Now, Sproul continues. He says, passive hardening is a totally different story. Passive hardening involves a divine judgment upon sin that is already present. All that God needs to do to harden the heart of a person whose heart is already desperately wicked is to give him over to his sin. We find this concept of judgment repeatedly in Scripture. And so that we can be clear, let's go to Romans chapter 1. Okay? In Romans 1, um, God has shown uh, Romans 1, 18 through 32. I'm not going to read it all. Uh, just kind of summing up, everybody knows about God's existence. They know his power, for God has clearly shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, etc., uh, etc. Et Yet they rejected this and uh, changed the glory of, God, of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man and birds, four-footed animals and creepy things. Therefore... God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, that is what was already in them, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up, or God gave them over to vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Uh, essentially, the way God is expressing His wrath is by giving them over to more sin and letting uh, letting their own sinfulness be their own punishment. Um, in Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians two, uh, starting on verse nine. This is after Paul has just talked about the. Uh, uh, the man of lawlessness he says this he says the coming of the lawless one is according to the work uh, according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Again, we see these people who had no love for the truth, no love for the light. And you kind of just, uh, just like what's reiterated in um, John 3, 18 and 19, I believe, that men love the darkness rather than the light. Well, because of that, God has every right to leave them in that and to leave them in their own lies that they want to believe. God is not obligated to say, you know, when he sees somebody uh, believing a lie, God is not obligated to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop. You're believing the wrong thing. No, God in his wrath and as in an expression of his wrath says, you want to believe that? Go ahead. You go right ahead and believe that. God has every right to do that. Um, this, uh, I like to call this the handover principle where God's handing people over. Uh, but we see the same thing in uh, in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, uh, this is pretty much the cycle, uh, at least as I like to call it. But we see Israel 
disobeying the Lord, forgetting Him. And then what do we see? The Lord sold them into the hands of their own enemies. God hands them over. And so, continuing back to Sproul. Okay. How does this work? To understand it properly, we must first look at another concept, God's common grace. This refers to the grace of God that all men commonly enjoy. The rain that refreshes the earth, uh, waters our crops, falls on the, on the, upon the just and the unjust alike, etc., uh, etc. Et okay? One of the most important elements of common grace is we enjoy the restraint of evil in the world. That restraint flows from many sources. Evil is restrained by policemen, laws, public opinion, balances of power, and so on. Though, though the world we live in is filled with wickedness, it is not as wicked as it possibly could be. God uses the means mentioned above as well as other means to keep evil in check. By His grace, He controls and bridles the amount of evil in the world. If evil were left totally unchecked, then life on this planet would be impossible. All that God has to do to harden people's heart is to remove the restraints. He gives them a longer leash. Rather than restricting their human freedom, He increases it. He lets them have their own way. In a sense, he gives them enough rope to hang themselves. It is not that God puts his hand on them to create evil in their hearts. He merely removes his holy hand of restraint from them and lets them do their own will. And this answers Mr. Ruggiero's question. Uh, how is it that if we are, let me see the question correctly, if we are totally uh, depraved, what is the point of the hardening? And of course, if the hardening is understood as passive and God letting us go, then that pretty much answers it right there. Well, pretty much answers the question. I think the main thing that really that's, that's coming out here uh, again is that Mr. Ruggiero really doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to Calvinism. Uh, as just seen and demonstrated in his understanding of what uh, he thinks the Calvinist is teaching from Romans 9, 17 through 18. It doesn't teach unconditional election. That wouldn't be the point from it. The point in that text is the reprobation of the sinner, that God has every right to withhold his mercy, his compassion, his saving grace from those who do not deserve it. And it really, it sounds like the way Mr. Ruggiero is arguing is that he's presupposing that, that everybody deserves God's saving grace. But if that's the case, how is that grace? If it's something owed to us, it's not grace. Uh, I think Romans 11 even argues that way. If it's, if it's debt, that is, if it's owed to you, it cannot be grace. I um, hope to deal with this uh, a lot more uh, thoroughly. Uh, I guess as Mr. Ruggiero keeps posting, I probably will keep posting alongside with him. Uh, I will try to demonstrate from the works of Calvinists themselves what Calvinists believe so that you can hear it uh, for yourselves and uh, you don't have to uh, take a second-hand uh, corrupted version of what somebody thinks Calvinists believe. Thanks for watching.